everybody, this is Tracy here for another edition of A View from Tracy's Point. And we are here to recap Being Mary Jane Season 4, Episode 17, which was titled Feeling Lost. When the show ended last week, um, Justin told Mary Jane that he was off to Paris because he needed a little time, a little space. And he was over the whole social media frenzy about their relationship. And he was a little hurt about the fact that um, someone had posted the picture of his former girlfriend, Simone, and that people were making fun of her. When we pick up on this episode, Mary Jane and Aaron are interviewing these, what are they call mariachi dancers, but they got on the whole, uh, the Mexican sombreros and um, I think like these Mexican blankets or shawls and Mary Jane was like doing like this here like they had then screwed that doggone sombrero into her head and she was in pain and if she tilted to the side the wrong way that like her whole head was gonna come off or something but I was like girl so after she gets through with her little um, Mexican interview, she's supposed to interview this girl named Jessica Lawrence. And so Jessica is the author of a parenting book. And so Mary Jane, you know, goes over to introduce herself and tell Jessica, you know, that she read the book and really enjoyed it. But uh, Jessica was a little standoffish and she was telling Mary Jane, oh, you don't have to pretend like you read the book or that you liked it. But then Mary Jane let her know I did read the book and I did like it. So the two of them get to talking and then she said something, I guess, to test Mary Jane to see if she had actually read the book. And of course, Mary Jane passed with flying colors because if we can say anything about our girl, she is on her A game and she does her research before she interviews people. So when she goes over to vent to uh, Kara and Ty, <laughs> they let her know that um, unconfirmed rumors has it that Jessica is dating Lee. So while they're talking about that little bit of gossip, Emma walks over and she's like, oh my God, I can't believe they dropped this on me. Garrett has just um, told me that I have to interview Jessica. So of course, Mary Jane get in her feelings and think that the girl, you know, doesn't want her to interview her, you know, because of the whole Lee thing. So she goes storming into the green room to confront the girl. And the girl was like, let me stop you right there before you go too far and make a fool out of yourself. Because Lee done told me that that's how you operate. She didn't really say that, but she let uh, Mary Jane know that the reason that she didn't ask for Emma to do the interview, that they told her they were switching um, Mary Jane out and putting Emma in place was because Emma has kids. So, you know, Mary Jane looking like a fool because she's like, oh, yeah, Emma does have kids. So when Mary Jane was getting ready to leave, then Jessica drops the real bomb on Mary Jane and lets her know that um, not only is Lee's comedy tour a success, you know, when he's talking about Mary Jane, <laughs> but also that a major network picked up his pilot to do a show based on their relationship. And Mary J was like, what the hell? Like, are you serious right now? And so I don't know if Jessica was really being shady in that moment or if she really thought her and Mary Jane were girlfriends and that she could drop that information. Uh, but I'm sure she um, went back and told Lee exactly how Mary Jane reacted to the news. And then I'm sitting there thinking, like how much time has passed since Mary Jane broke up with Lee because he sure has been doing a lot in that short span of time because I'm thinking there's only been a few weeks, but he done got a new girlfriend, you know. Well, yeah, I think he got a new girlfriend really quick because Mary Jane cheated on him with Justin, so she was already in a relationship. So she was already in a new relationship, but he didn't have time to write a pilot and pitch it to a network and get it green lighted and all that too. I believe Lee might have been writing that script while him and Mary Jane was still together. So after Mary Jane, you know, leaves out with Jessica, of course, she got to go find Kara and Aaliyah. So Aaliyah confirms, you know, that there is a pilot out there and that there's already a buzz about the show. And she lets her know that, you know, her contacts have, you know, the scoop on the um, first episode. And so she mentions that um, nobody's really going to pay attention to this show because he says in the first episode that Mary Jane um, asked him, did he love her the first night that they went out? And so then Aaliyah was like, but nobody's going to believe 
leave that, and then Mary Jane gives this look, and then Cara and Aaliyah are like, oh my God. But then Cara was like, okay, but don't worry about it. You know, it's not going to be a success. So I was sitting there wondering, but dang, if he put that part in there, is he going to put that part in there about the rubber band? Remember she put that rubber band on his wrist and said that every time she popped it, she wanted him to get hotter or go deeper or something like that. So he's going to really uh, make a fool out of Mary Jane on this show. So Mary Jane decides that she wants to get in front of the story. So Aaliyah lets her know, you know, Ryan Seacrest has been wanting to do an interview with you. This will be the perfect opportunity. But MJ is like, no, 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 we ain't going that route. Let's get on the Breakfast Club. <laughs> I'm sitting there like, girl, Charlamagne will eat you alive. <laughs> like, ain't no way that you could go on that show and survive. And so both Aaliyah and Carl was probably thinking the same thing that I was thinking because they was giving her the side eye like, girl, are you crazy? Mary Jane insists that this is what she wants to do, so they have no other choice but to humor her and go along with it. So Aaliyah schedules a run through with Mary Jane where they're going to role play and Aaliyah pretends that she's Charlemagne and MJ is herself. So then Aaliyah starts, you know, asking her questions in the same manner that Charlemagne would ask them. And Mary Jane ain't ready. <laughs> she went on this long rant about you know women's suffrage and relationships and why men never get judged when things go wrong and nobody ever asks the man what role they play in the breakdown of a woman and Aaliyah was basically like you're making excuses <laughs> for why you cheated on this man and she was you know I mean Mary Jane was all out in left field somewhere I was sitting there like girl oh first of all you wouldn't even get all that out on the Breakfast Club because they would have cut you off so many times and Charlemagne would have twisted and turned your words. And I could just see him not going, oh, so you're admitting that you are a hoe, but the reason you a hoe is because the man made you a hoe? So explain that to me. How'd that look? So I could just picture it right now. Mary Jane, it ain't going to be a good look. You know, and Aaliyah, you know, she was trying to let Mary Jane know, you know, she wasn't ready. This wasn't going to turn out well. But then Mary Jane pulled the I'm your boss card. Like, friendship aside. Because I think Aaliyah said, you know, girl, I'm speaking to you as a friend. And then Mary Jane quickly pulled the friend card off the table and told Aaliyah, you work for me. You know, and you're going to do what I tell you to do. And I'm just like, really, Mary Jane? That's <laughs> like so typical of you. And that's exactly how she operates because that's how she operated when she was in Atlanta. And she just brought that same nasty attitude with her to New York. And then let's stick a pin here because now we find out that Aaliyah and Ty are MJ's employees. Like he's her stylist and Aaliyah is her publicist, as in, is she paying their salaries? And I thought Aaliyah was the intern or the second tier publicist assistant or something like that with the PR firm that they brought in to help MJ's image after Rhonda left and the rankings were dropping. But then at the housewarming, when she was telling that guy, you know, to give her that picture or to delete that picture, she said she ran her own PR firm. And I was wondering then, how did she go from being an an employee with this PR firm to now she running the PR firm. So y'all need to get it together with this writing. And then now she's Mary Jane's publicist. And do publicists hang around their employer's jobs like um, Aaliyah hangs around MJ's job? Like y'all let me know how all of that works. So Aaliyah doesn't take um, MJ's insults personally, but she does go to Cara and tell Cara she needs to check her girl. So Cara gets MJ to realize that she can't survive um, without Aaliyah and that it would be a huge mistake for her to go on the breakfast club <laughs> because she's not ready. And then she uh, promises MJ that she's going to help her get her own primetime special if she just slow her roll and um, act like she got some sense. So Mary Jane does go to um, Aaliyah and apologize and ask her to cancel the appearance on the breakfast club and tell her, you know, that she'll do whatever she tells her to do. So they agree to find a way to control the narrative and to figure out how to stop um, Lee in his tracks so that this show doesn't um, make it to the airwaves. We move over to Danny. So Danny is upset that she was benched after doing that little video behind everybody's back. And so she goes in 
and begs Garrett for another chance, but he doesn't um, take the bait and tell her no, that she's been benched for a reason and she needs to get over it. So she's vowing that you know, she won't make any more videos. She won't tweet bad things about the show. And when uh, Garrett was like, nope, ain't happening, and he walks out, then uh, she goes against what she had just promised she wasn't going to do. So she sends out a tweet to her fan base, to social media, basically bashing uh, Garrett. So Garrett is now so razzled that he has security escorting him around. And I was hoping that he had brought the man in to escort Danny um, out of the building. But um, that was for his own sake. <laughs> Danny is still there. At the same time that Carl was trying to play mediator between Mary Jane and Aaliyah, she was also working with Orlando on his broadcasting career in hopes that it would speed up his retirement. And I don't know why Carr is trying to get that man out of baseball if that's what he really... Oh, does he have an injury that he's playing with? Because I can't figure out, like, why he can't just play out his career while long it lasts and then go into the broadcasting. But I'm thinking that it did come out that he had a bike injury or something. So he's scheduled to appear to discuss uh, Latino players who are no longer standing for the national anthem at baseball games. Let's insert some sarcasm here. So I think what they're trying to say, um, black people, is that the Latino people, they stick together. And if one of them say we're going to fight for the cause, they all going to get behind them and fight for the cause. And that black people, y'all scattered all over the place, acting like y'all can't miss a football game to support Colin Kaepernick and his stance against the um, injustices in America against black people. So, um, I don't know what y'all going to do with that little bit of information. Y'all going to fall in line and get on board with the NFL boycott? Or y'all just going to let the Latino people be out here boycotting the national anthem during the baseball games? So, Cara uh, returns home and she's on the phone with Mary Jane. And there is a knock on the door and she's, as Orlando is trying to get her attention. So, she goes and opens the door and it is Orlando's mom, Delphine. <laughs> so... It was so funny because her and Cara are the same person. And then in that scene where he kissed his mother on the lips, I was just like, oh, that's nasty. <laughs> like, who does that? So Cara, you know, she already decided that she don't like um, Mama Delphine and that Mama is there trying to interrupt her plan to get Orlando off that baseball field and into uh, the broadcast studio. But uh, Mama Delphine said that she was home from Miami and that they was going to the old neighborhood and she's going to love it there and see where Orlando come from. So they end up at this park and there was like this big cookout going on and Orlando was interacting with the little kids, you know, who look up to him as this superstar baseball player. And so Carr was uh, listening to Mama Delphine talk about how that's where Orlando's supposed to be. He ain't supposed to be in no um, news studio doing the news. So Carr was head up back to the lady, tell the lady like, well, I got a plan and um, this ain't a part of it. So now these two, I guess, going to be in a battle to see, you know, who wins. Uh, do Orlando keep playing baseball or do he go along with the plan and go into the broadcast studio? So once they get back um, home, you know, Carl's trying to talk to Orlando and Orlando's kind of acting like he's having doubts about the whole broadcasting thing and leaving baseball. But Carl is like, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> you don't get the bike out of this. And then I think they made the deal. No, that may have been later on in the show where they made the deal that if he um, pursues the whole baseball, if he pursues the broadcasting thing, then she will get back on board with her plans that she had for you know what she wanted to do in the future with her career. So Cara decides that it'll be a good idea to invite Delphine to come to the studio and watch Orlando's segment live and in living color. So when she gets there, she has on like the same dress that Cara has on, but it was like a darker shade of blue. And everybody is looking like, um, y'all got a lot in common, you know, but Cara was like, no, we don't. But y'all, we dressed the light. Both of them love to say mommy and poppy. And then when they walked out together, they both was walking the same way. <laughs> so let me 
found out Orlando tried to marry his mama. <laughs> so right before the interview, Garrett comes in and announces that Danny will co-anchor uh, with Aaron when they talk to Orlando about the whole um, anthem protest that's going on. So Kara is livid and believes that it would be a big mistake but Orlando disagrees and thinks that it'll be a great idea and that it'll help drive home, you know, his point about why he's doing the anthem. But Cara's like, she will eat you alive. <laughs> Orlando was like, well, thanks for the vote of confidence. So the two of them have like a stalemate and they ask Garrett to get out of his own office and then they talk about it and Cara decides that, okay, well, I'm going to be in the head, Pete, and so I'm going to be in your earpiece and then I'll be guiding you and hopefully we can get through this whole thing. So once they go live, of course, Danny was in full motion and talking over everybody. And uh, she tells Orlando he's ungrateful and anti-American and that wasn't um, a good idea because both Cara and Delphine was in that control room. Like, who the hell she thinks she is? Then, of course, Cara got the last say-so because she whispered in uh, the earpiece and told uh, Orlando, you know, talk about your mom. Tell the story about your mom and how she came to America. And so Orlando handled it like a real G would handle it. You know, he told the story about his mom. And so he told the story about how his mom was one of three million people back in 1986 during the uh, Ronald Reagan era. And then, um, oh, it was back when Ronald Reagan passed the um, Immigration Reform and Control Act. And that was a time when, you know, even most conservative politicians saw immigration for what it is, you know, a humanitarian issue. And they started talking about how his mother risked her life and, you know, to give him a better life. You know, so then he went on to say, you know, if his mom can defy the odds that were against her back then, then surely, you know, he can deal with internet trolls. <laughs> And then he said, like, in his mind, you know, he's standing up for what the American model is all about. You know, he was like, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And, you know, he's like, this is the most patriotic thing that I could be doing, you know, is sitting down for this national anthem. And so Danny said something about being privileged you're taking advantage of your privilege or something, she said. And then um, he said that um, we all live with privilege. It's just that I choose to do mine for good or something like that. And then um, they ended the interview right there, you know, without letting, um, Car without letting Danny get the last word in. So it looks like Orlando may have hit a triple because he shut Danny down big time. Um, his mama is in love with the idea, you know, of him now being a news anchor. And she thinks that Car is all that and a bag of chips. So they did good with that one. And then before we head over to Atlanta, because we had some action, you know, down in the dirty, dirty. So if you're wondering um, about Justin, he is still in Paris. And we do learn the story behind the whole stock options and how he got them. And he was an employee for the company. So it turns out that Simone uh, was like a tech genius and that she worked for that startup company or it was her startup company and she got all that stock but then she was diagnosed with cancer and she ended up dying i think in 2010 and she left everything to justin and so now i'm wondering like were the two of them still together when she died i'm sure mary jane really feels like an ass now and is really gonna go cuckoo for coco Bus trying to figure out how she could ever top or outdo this woman that has died and it's just going to be interesting to find out like if her and justin were in a relationship when she died or were they just friends at that point or whatever? And then somebody was saying, well, why didn't Justin just tell Mary Jane the truth about the stock? And my feelings on that is it was not a Mary Jane's business. And like Justin said, you know, people reveal things about themselves as they feel more comfortable with you. And I think part of the whole social media and iPhones and all that stuff is that people think that they are entitled to know everything about you, to know all your business. And that's why relationships are not as strong these days as they used to be is because we don't take the time to get to know people and allow people to reveal their own truths in their own time. And then we get anxious and when they don't tell us what we want to hear right away, then we start conjuring up craziness in our minds and stuff like that. So 
that's why Justin didn't tell Mary Jane the truth. But he did, um, like, he didn't even talk to Mary Jane when he, he sent her the obituary, a link to the obituary, like, didn't say nothing or anything. And so maybe that's the way he deals with stuff, you know, in his own due time. Let's move over to Atlanta. <laughs> So Patrick and the guy that he met when he did the rally a couple of episodes, so they're bonding over a game of dominoes. And so the guy was kind of like opening up to Patrick. And Patrick, you know, it was obvious that Patrick wishes that he had a son <laughs> instead of um, Nisi. And then the little girl, Tracy, who then just disappeared. We didn't know where the little girl then went to. She went upstairs and she ain't never come back down. So the two have a discussion, you know, about acceptance and family and loving those who embraced you and no longer and no sooner than Patrick gave that little sermon did his whole world turn upside down and them same words came back to haunt him. So he's trying to find out where his mama is and the daddy was like, well, you need to call her. So then finally Patrick is like, where is she? Like, tell me what's going on. But uh, Papa Patterson, you know, he wasn't telling. He just said, call your mama and find out what's going on. So he keeps texting her and texting her. So she finally responds. And the two of them, um, I think they met at the hotel that she's staying at. So they're having lunch. And then Mama Hella, you know, <laughs> she, um, she a little special. Because she sat there and was like telling um, Patrick the little story about her and Frank. And then she kept saying 44 years ago, like, Patrick... Can you add? Because I keep saying 44 years ago, but, but it's not clicking in your mind that you're 44 or close to 44. So finally, she had to just spell it out and tell Patrick that um, Frank is his daddy. So Patrick jumps up. You know, he don't want to hear it. He yelling in these white folks' restaurant, <laughs> like embarrassing Mama Helen and everything. He tells him, leave him alone. So then he goes over to the house, and then he wants to jack up um, Papa Pals. <laughs> So he grabbed him up by his collar and I'm like, boy, you have lost your mind. Don't you know your daddy used to be chef back in the day? So, you know, Papa Patterson gave him his moment, you know, and said, boy, I'm still your daddy. Don't make me F you up in this. <laughs> so Patrick came to his senses and let his daddy down. But then he's yelling at him saying, you know, don't you ever call yourself my father. I'm not your son. And so, you know, Papa Patterson's like, boy, you're going to always be my son. And I know you're upset because we both are still angry with your mama. But we're going to get over it. And Patrick was like, like he really wanted to punch his daddy in the face when the person he should be angry with is his mama. But I guess it's easier to be angry at the person who acted like they got some sense than it is with this person that you can't even understand what they could have been thinking like they didn't kept this secret from you all your life and then uh papa patterson revealed that frank used to be an addict and an alcoholic and a gambler and then patrick was like why do you ever tell me because that's where i get it from but then um papa patterson said he didn't tell him about all of that because that just would have been another crutch for patrick to have as to why you know he can't get over you know his issues that he has so then Patrick goes to his um, Narcotics Anonymous meeting. And so he he didn't come out and tell the people that his mama, you know, slept with another man and that his daddy ain't his daddy and all that. He just said that his world had been turned upside down and he has never wanted to get high more <laughs> than he did in this moment right now. You know, but good thing, you know, he was strong enough to go to the meeting and get some help. And so I think that was about it. And then the show um, ended up, it ended with Mary Jane and one of the production assistants from the station brought her this huge uh, floral arrangement. It was like two dozen roses. And so she's looking at it and she's like, oh my God, you know, this is so sweet. Who is this from? It's not from Aaliyah, is it? So she asked that question because Aaliyah had got her some um, supermarket, you know, the grocery store flowers and gave them to her. And then I guess she was acting like uh, Justin had gave her the flowers. So Justin sent her a cute little card and let her know, you know, you've been lying about um, me sending you flowers. So I thought I'd make an honest woman out of you. So that just made Mary Jane's life. And she was jumping up and down and dancing around the apartment. I'm thinking, dang, that's the first time we done seen Mary Jane 
this happy. This is Amari Hardwick was on the first season of the show and just busting her bike out every other episode. <laughs> so that is it for me, guys. Uh, let me know what you thought about this episode. Um, leave your comments below, rate the video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And I shall talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. <laughs>